church. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday in Lent. I'm Pastor Colleen and I am the pastor here at Grace Lutheran in Shillington. It is a joy to have you worship with us today. As part of our Lenten journey here at Grace, we have asked our members and friends to help us build a barnyard. And I just wanted to remind folks of that today. We are asking folks to save their loose change and put it aside and send it into Grace or drop it off if you're driving by so that we can help some families. Your contributions will go to ELCA World Hunger where they will, will help a family or we hope families in being able to purchase livestock for their families and communities. As the snow is finally melting, we are hoping to create a barnyard in front of the church so that you can see what animals your money has helped us to purchase. Hopefully there will soon be pigs and chicks and cows all over our front lawn. So if you've been saving your change, please drop it off at the church. You don't have to wait until Easter to give it to us because we'd love to be able to show the progress of the farm along the way. So thank you in advance for all of your generosity and for your help. And now I invite you to prepare a worship space. Perhaps light a candle, have some bread and wine or some grape juice ready for communion, and then sit in your most comfortable chair Take a deep breath and know for this time that we are together and God is most certainly present. Let us prepare our hearts for worship as we take this time to listen to today's prelude.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. And now hear the good news. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ, that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, everyone. We are continuing our Resurrection Eggs project by moving on to our third and fourth eggs. If you haven't gotten to start your project yet, you can view last week's Time with Children on the church website or Facebook to get caught up. When we left off last time, Jesus had just entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Our third and fourth eggs cover the time in between Palm Sunday and the Passover on Thursday. Egg number three signifies something big in the story, anointing. Anointing is when you smear or rub oil or an ointment onto something, usually during a religious ceremony. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper, which meant a diseased or contagious person, in Bethany, which is where he was staying when he wasn't in Jerusalem. A woman had a bottle of something called nard. And nard was an amber oil from a flowering plant, kind of what we would call perfume. It was expensive. It was 300 or more pence, which basically in today's terms would mean a whole year's worth of paychecks. She broke the bottle and she poured this perfume onto Jesus's head. A lot of people, including a disciple, criticized her for doing this act of service. A lot of people think this story signifies how Jesus was like the Passover lamb. For the Passover festival, a lamb would be chosen. Its feet would be anointed with an oil six days before Passover. Its head would be anointed two days before Passover, and then on Passover, it would be sacrificed or killed. Jesus was like the lamb. He was anointed a great high priest to do things on behalf of us in the garden, and then he would be sacrificed for us and buried. The word Christ means anointed in another language. So whenever you hear Jesus Christ, it means Jesus the anointed. So Maddie, if you want to pick out our third egg here. Okay. And again, I will give you suggestions. You're welcome to tailor this to yourself however you would like. I have these mini perfume bottles here. If you have larger ones, you could put perfume on a cotton ball in your egg. You could, if you have a magazine, get one of those ads where you can sniff the perfumes. You could put a piece of that inside your egg, whatever works for you. All right, so we'll get that perfume in there. Okay. Also during this time, Jesus is praying and teaching in the temple in Jerusalem. The chief priests didn't like what Jesus was saying and didn't want people to follow him instead of them. It was a challenge to their authority and they wanted him arrested for treason for claiming to be a king. Back in those days, they had had a lot of bad experiences with past kings. So for someone to refer to themselves or be known as a king would be very bad in their eyes. Jesus' disciple Judas went to the priests and he agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And so that's why in our fourth egg, I'm going to put three dimes in to represent 30 pieces of silver. Feel, feel free to put in any coins that you want, any amount, any type of coin, real or fake. Do you want to pick out an egg and you can put that in? 
Okay. Jesus knew of Judas's plans and predicted it at the Last Supper the next day. After the Last Supper, when Jesus and his disciples were in the garden, Judas kissed Jesus and called him rabbi, which means teacher or leader, in front of the temple guards. This would lead to the arrest of Jesus. Afterwards, Judas immediately felt sorry and tried to return the silver, but the priests refused to take the silver back. Judas left the money there on the temple floor and disappeared. And now we'll get ready to pray. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for always loving me. Thank you for always loving me. And for sending Jesus to save me. And for sending Jesus to save me. Help me to be strong. Help me to be strong. And rely on you. And rely on you. To do what's best for me each day. To do what's best for me each day. Amen. Amen. See you next week. Bye. The first reading for the second Sunday in Lent is from the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly Psalm 22, beginning with the 23rd verse. You who fear the Lord, give praise. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. Stand in awe of the Lord, all you offspring of Israel. For the Lord does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither is the Lord's face hidden from them. But when they cry out, the Lord hears them. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the sight of those who fear the Lord. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Let those who seek the Lord give praise. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of nations shall bow before God. For, For dominion, dominion belongs to the Lord, who rules over the nations. Indeed, all who sleep in the earth shall bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust, though they be dead, shall kneel before the Lord. Their descendants shall serve the Lord, whom they shall proclaim to generations to come. They shall proclaim God's deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying to them, The Lord has acted. The second reading for today is from the fourth chapter of Romans, beginning with the thirteenth verse. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham 
or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciple, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know about you, but I love the Academy Awards. I like the way everyone is so dressed up. I love the hosts and the music. I love the movie clips. I love the winners and the losers. This year, we don't even know yet which movies and actors will be nominated. Because of the pandemic, the awards have been pushed back to April. And also this year, many, if not most of the movies are available through different streaming services. So 
for the first time, I may actually get to see most of the nominated movies. When the Oscars do finally air, I plan on watching the show. And I will hope for some great moments. And I will remember the great and the not so great moments of past shows. For example, there was that time a few years back when they announced the Oscar for the best movie and the presenters announced the wrong film. The presenter said, and the Oscar goes to La La Land. Then about a minute later, Jimmy Kimmel grabbed the microphone and said, well, actually the wrong name was announced. The Oscar for best film is not La La Land, but is actually Moonlight. It was one of those moments I'll probably never forget. But equally for me, there was another moment that stood out for me, which happened, I think, a year earlier than that one. And it was the year when the song Glory from the movie Selma was performed. What struck me was how the songwriters, John Legend and Common, described in this song the march to Selma in terms of glory. I mean, really think about that for a moment. That march, along with the larger struggle for civil rights, was filled with confrontation and suffering and sacrifice, and yet they sang of glory. Well, I think it's because we find glory, and for that matter, power and strength and security, only in those moments when we surrender our claims to power and strength and security and glory in order to serve others. And we know this, you and I, we all know this, because each and every time we make ourselves vulnerable to the needs of those around us, each time we give ourselves in love to another person, each time we get out of our own way and seek not what we want, but what the world needs, we come alive, we are uplifted, we experience the glory of God made manifest. That's what Jesus means when he invites his disciples then and now to take up their cross and follow him. Because only those who are willing to lose their life out of love will save it. Now, let me be clear at this point. I'm not talking about a kind of doormat love or theology where we are to ignore our genuine human deeds altogether or see ourselves as not deserving of love, dignity, and respect. And so there's no justification here for enduring abusive relationships or tolerating injustice. Rather, what I'm talking about is the giving ourselves, giving of ourselves in love which is, of course, quite different than having others take it from us. And that giving in love almost always includes sacrifice, denying ourselves and our immediate gratification so as to meet the needs of others. And again, we know that this is true. We do it perhaps most naturally as parents, sacrificing all kinds of things in the hope of providing for our children. But we also do it as children, as friends, as spouses and neighbors and more. And each time we do so, each time we call into question a momentary want of our own in order to satisfy a genuine need of someone else, we experience a kind of glory. We know this, but I 
think it's hard to believe, or at least it's hard to hold on to. Because so much in our culture is designed to make us think that the only thing that matters and the only thing that will bring us peace, security, and happiness is looking out for ourselves by gratifying our immediate desires, whatever they may be. This is particularly true in the world of advertising where so much time, energy, creativity, and money are poured into advertisements that seek to make us feel inadequate in order to induce us to buy something that promises to make us feel better about ourselves. But here's the thing. Those advertisements, they're a lie. Not that there aren't lots of great things out there to buy and enjoy, but not one of them will actually make us feel complete or more human or more adequate or more accepted or loved. They just won't. The only thing that does that is connection to others and the community that those connections bring. And connecting to others in order to fashion and nurture community requires sacrifice. There's just no getting around it. And the marvelous thing is that when we stop worrying about gratifying our wants and instead look to the needs around us, and when others begin to do the same, well, we find more than we'd ever imagined. More life, more joy, more happiness, more acceptance. Because we find a whole community looking out for us instead of only ourselves, just as we are looking out for the community of persons around us. This, I think, is the gospel's greatest news. It's the gospel's theory of everything, that the more we give, the more we receive. The more we seek to be a friend, the more friends we discover, and the more we love, and the more we are loved. We know this, I am sure, but we forget. And more, we are persuaded and encouraged to not believe it. And so Jesus comes and doesn't just say these words. He lives them, giving himself out of love for all people and creating a reservoir of life, love, and glory that far surpasses anything the world can offer. However, it is not what his disciples expect. They too are children of the world, and although they weren't bombarded with 5,000 advertising images every day as we are, they still imagined that the secret to life was strength and power rather than vulnerability and love. And so they interpreted Jesus' miraculous acts as demonstrations of power rather than manifest manifestations of love. And when Jesus describes the greatest act of love, giving his life for them and the world, well, all they can do is object. But Jesus will not be deterred. He will continue on the path of sacrificial love and continue to love his disciples even when they misunderstand him or choose not to follow that path until the very end. And at the end, God takes what looks like weakness and demonstrates strength and transforms what looks like disgrace and reveals God's surprising even unsettling, but ultimately life-giving glory. 
We know this, but it is hard to hold on to. Think about your lives. Think about the week that has just passed. I'll bet you can think of a time you experienced that strange kind of glory that comes from sacrificial love. Perhaps it was stopping to help someone in need. Perhaps it was making a donation to a charitable cause. Perhaps it was standing up for somebody who was being picked on in school or at work. Perhaps it was delaying some gratification in order to tend to another person's need. Perhaps it was just listening to someone. Perhaps it was wearing a mask when you left the house. See, you get the idea. We do these things all the time. And each time we do them, we experience the life Jesus talks about. So perhaps the best cure to the amnesia our culture and the world seeks to induce is to think about and remember and share these moments of unexpected glory. Because as we do, we are drawn into God's theory of everything and discover again the truth Jesus shares. Those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their lives for any sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Amen. And now let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. As I offer up each petition, I will end with, Hear us, O God, and you are invited to respond. Your mercy is great. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. We pray especially this day for Joyce Brown, Sarah Cummings, Sherry Daddario, Fred Ensman, Marjorie Hill, Skip O'Leary, Betty Rickenbach, Lynn Rocco, Douglas Cepeda, Myrtle Schlauck, Diane Spatz, Elsa Treo, Scott Van Horn, and Cynthia Vincent. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In grief and sadness we lift today the 500,000 500, plus people who have died of COVID in this past year. We ask that you would hold tightly to all those who are grieving and help them know that each life mattered. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray for our Grace Prayer Family Ministry. And today we pray for Barbara Wolf, Gary and Jan Yost, and Joan and Mark Youngerman. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called to take up their cross and follow you. Especially we pray for Earl Hall and the Reverend Bill Weiser, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves in all our prayers to you, O oh faithful God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, dear church, may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's share that peace with one another. Peace be with you. 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 Peace be with you.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now you are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. And now, go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.